an incredible panel of people who are far too busy to be here with us, so I'm very grateful. It's also um, upfront season. So they've taken time out of their day to talk to us just a little bit about what's going on in mobile video. Um, I thought, since we're talking about a shift in, in video and consumption, <coughs> we should start by asking all the panelists, uh, when was the last time you actually watched live, uh, non-time-shifted, non-recorded TV? How about you, Andy? Um, last night. Last night? Well, was, it a, was, it, was it a sporting event? Uh, yeah, it was the basketball game. Yes, okay. So, so sports notwithstanding. But other than that, uh, not at all. Okay, Aaron? Yeah, Bulls game over the weekend. Other than that, I have no idea. Uh, yeah. um, I just cut my cord, so I haven't watched live TV in a while. Uh, mainly going to bars and watching sports. Yeah. Got it. Um, probably within the last week, um, Blackhawks game. I think it was August 2014, as a matter of fact. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, uh, probably, last, uh, probably last night, some sports recap highlights. Okay, got it. So either sports or time shifted recorded. Um, I actually watch the local news every morning, New York City local news, um, for about four seconds in the top right-hand corner of my TV while I'm shifting through Mickey Mouse Club episodes for my three-year-old. So that's, <laughs> that's my live TV. Um, so. These folks all work with, with massive uh, household names in the advertising world. They're also responsible for, um, as well as digital, mobile, all the offline planning as well. So it's upfront season now. Um, what are you seeing that's different this year, um, specific to the upfronts, that's going to influence how you plan for mobile video uh, versus your, your typical TV spending? Um, Aaron, do you maybe want to kick us off there? Yeah, I mean, historically, you know, I've um, looked after the largest mobile video upfront, and we no longer have any screen upfront. It's a total market, total screen approach. So we don't have, hey, here's our mobile video partners, here's our TV. It's who are the partners that can deliver across the board as one theme, but then an o overall theme of, okay, addressability. Who do we go to for that? Um, connectivity, who do we go to for that? It's not mobile only. Um, it's across the board, single partners hitting all screens. And is that similar for the rest of the folks um, with, with planning and buying teams on that stage as well? Yeah, uh, our, at Zenith Optimedia, we're looking at fluid video across every, every screen. Um, I, I think we wanted to, we, and we shifted probably a few years ago, um, and it's really to try to track the consumer and, and see their habits. Whatever, um, and kids is a great example, and you see that as a native experience for kids. They're watching on their iPads, they're watching on um, smartphones, and, and that's just like a native shift for the entire industry. And just looking at that, we wanted to go after content and um, ad tech capabilities that make it possible for us to reach the same audience anywhere where they're watching it. So based on that shift, then how are you determining what the spend mix needs to be? Because I, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. I mean, Jeff, would you agree? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's interesting in the, you know, the industry as a whole how it's sort of evolved you know, uh, in terms of the, the networks providing uh, you know, new currencies, whether that's you know, fluidity deals in, in prime fronts where they're saying you know, you're going to automatically get a certain amount of uh, impressions across, you know, uh, mobile or you know, FVP or, v or VOD. So they're auto automatically kind of helping you follow the consumer because they know that that they know their consumers and where they are. But we take that as sort of a, a starting point, you know, across our brands. We don't, uh, you know, just rely on that. There are a lot of other things that go into it. It could be. Um, you know, what are we trying to accomplish for each brand? You know, because we take a, a, a real bespoke approach to every brand and how we're going to plan for it and how much weight should go uh, into video. Right. And we are video neutral. We're, you know, across all platforms, uh, but where it makes sense. Yep. So ultimately, it really comes down to um, sort of what our, our tools tell us as a starting point, what we're getting from fluidity deals, and then a lot of it is that human element because we know where our brands are, what our consumers are doing, what the usage is, and then we're adding additional weight where we need to. Yeah, uh, also interesting too about talking about mobile extensions off of some of the TV buying and the fluidity <coughs> budgets. From a publisher perspective, Andy, 
Um, are you offering a lot of mobile extensions to your advertisers, or is that sold separately, or what's sure. the mix there? Everything we do is bundled together. Okay. So when we're selling digital, we're selling mobile along with it. Um, we try to bu bundle that in with TV as well when we can, um, and try to sell it at similar rates. So when we're selling out there, we're trying to put mobile into everything we do. Gotcha. Wonderful. Um, so if we could talk about auto for a minute, Aaron, you know, kind of that elusive um, male, you know, younger, middle-aged audience. Um, what have you guys found worked really well to reach that, that tough audience to find? What's the mix look like there? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we do somewhat of a similar approach in that we are looking at video, again, across all channels. Um, and I think what we've found is that, yes, mobile, especially with auto, um, we know so many people are shopping. <coughs> Um, on their mobile devices, tablet especially, um, and we've seen spikes in site traffic just from mobile. So we know that that's where they're going when they're looking at cars, um, whether at home, their home or even on the lot. Um, so we found that when we want to reach that audience, um, it makes sense to uh, really target mobile um, and uh, tablet devices. And then I think you know we build in a lot of auto optimization within our plan. So when we can um, target across different video across different platforms, um, it's important for us to say, okay, maybe we don't know what the right mix is. We're going to let the consumer sort of tell us where they're most engaged with this content, and that's really helping us then identify, okay, how did we optimize throughout the campaign? What does that tell us for the future of? You know, was it tablet, was it mobile, was it desktop that drove the most engagement um, or whatever those uh, KPIs were for that campaign. So speaking then, we're really talking about a behavior shift and an audience shift. Um, how, you know, are there different things that consumers are doing in mobile that's very encouraging for mobile video that is working better for you than other formats? You're able to, to, to post better results for advertisers. Any specific examples there? Um, I know, Jeff, we talked a little bit about contemporizing some of the brands that you work on and shifting that way? Sure, yeah, I think, I think for, um, for a lot of our audiences ac across the brands, it's, it's really about giving them something that you know, lends value. So um, to, to the contemporizing point, you know, just the fact that we are present for them when, you know, when they need to be, whether they're going shopping or they're you know, within, you know, a hundred yards of, of, of a store and we're giving them that that recipe or that you know or that brand message or you know those kinds of things um, you know the fact that we're cross screen contemporizes us from a, from a video standpoint but then the, but then when we use some of those um, whether they're geofencing or you know dynamic targeting to really be relevant when they need that um, information it is, is really where the value comes in and where they, um, I think the, the brands really get paid back for being part of those um, instances. So assigning the right tactic to the right audience, to the right approach and, and where they are. Absolutely, and, and, and understanding the kind of the, the usage patterns, if, yep. uh, whether they are, you know, they're on mobile when they're leaving their house, uh, we may, may weather trigger and add to them if it's, if it's raining or if it's cold or what have you. And just knowing that later on in the day, they'll be on their tablet. And so being able to sequential target and message them, right. again, keeps, keeps uh, mobile helps us stay very relevant and yep. again, provide that value. Um, targeting is, is so interesting, and there's a lot of different ways that we can target. Is anyone successfully um, testing some of the, the commercial, television commercial retargeting onto mobile device off of a TV commercial um, sequentially that way? Um, it's something we're looking into. I don't know. I apologize to jump in. Yeah. Um, something we're looking into. Something that has a lot of value to us. You see someone watching a program on Adult Swim, being able to target those users in an Adult Swim game. Is, is hugely beneficial to us. So we're trying to figure out what the right method is for that. You know, a lot of it is very gray, how to identify the user, how to match them with the TV, how to get the devices in the household. Um, but it's something that we think is, is going to, it's going to be important. Yeah, I mean, it's just an identifier. It's another identifier of an individual. The big theme here is it's living data. And that's how you can follow consumers. I don't care about third party data. Like that's stale, it's old, it's three months old. That's not me now. 
you know, you, the way that we are approaching and everybody should be approaching is real time living data. Who I am now is not who I am from a consumption perspective in three hours. So you need to be able to real time update what I'm doing and follow me and deliver that message. And those are the only partners that we're working with moving forward is who's delivering us that living data, not a stale third party um, segment, which every partner has the third part, the same third party segment. And you know, I say it's an identifier because that's one way that you can follow consumers based on this living data. But the underlying um, factor is the real time component of data and that's gonna inform where and what screen you're reaching consumers on. Yeah, living data uh, has, has definitely become more and more relevant most recently. Is there a way, you know, Yale, are you guys looking at specific partners for that? Is there something that resonates? Um, what, what is the, a real timeline for a relevant piece of living data? What provides that for you? Yeah, so we, um, we try, I agree with that completely. Um, live data is the key to reaching consumers with the relevant message at the right time. Um, we, we try to take in, into consideration um, some of their location data uh, to help to source where they are in the marketplace. Um, we're trying to do attribution on when they see ads and going into the store and the data that's assumed from uh, where they're at in the current state. Um, we're also taking into account um, any actions that they're doing in real time. I, th I think when you're talking about when they're watching television in real time or any screen in real time and trying to use that to then have a sequential message, a lot of the ACR technology, the audio content recognition software, um, that is very nascent. It's the problem with it is there's not enough scale for us. Um, so uh, Rentrack and uh, TiVo data, a, a lot of that, I think that's what you're talking about. It, it's not providing us that live feed of how do we reach the consumer and really affect um, messaging moving forward to get them three hours from now. Um, those are the challenges that we have now. Some of the other things that we're doing are reaching out to the actual um, OEMs, LG and Samsung uh, of the world to try to get their data because they're, they're starting to collect data on viewing habits on any of their screens. Um, so trying to work with them to provide a live signal back um, so that we're seeing they have uh, smart TVs, they have smart phones, they have smart uh, yep. tablets. Um, so a screen to us is just a screen, yep. regardless of the size of the screen. Um, and then what are the, the data signals um, that inform us? Our, our philosophy is live ROI. So we obviously want to get to the moment data um, to inform our, our activation decisions. Yeah, I, and that's great. One of the things we talk about at Millennial all the time is, is the concept of video on anything and anything on video in terms of layering different assets in, not being limited to a specific you know, screen size. Um, can, can you all give a, a quick piece of advice to the crowd around um, length of uh, mobile video ad and what seems to be working best for your clients? And Andy got great perspective across many clients as well um, from the Turner side of the house. Yeah, we actually ran a research study because the assumption or the hypothesis is shorter form video, shorter ad, best on mobile. Um, the whole Vine concept of six second ads, horrible. Like people hated it. They actually thought it was a um, distraction because they were like, where's the message? I'm not getting the rest of it. Um, 15 was the best and um, consumers didn't balk at 30 second ads. And we even thought content length impacted um, how people, um, people's perception of ad length, nothing. People loved the 15 and 30 second. We tried it across a multitude of brands, um, different creative within a brand, and apparently people like good ads um, and didn't really like the six second Yeah, the quality um, part of it is pretty interesting too. So Jeff, can you talk a little bit about where your mobile video ads specifically come from? Are they repurposed TV spots? Are they built specifically for mobile? How does that work? Um, you know, they're, they're, they're both. Um, so it, it really does depend. We have, um, so when we think about what the consumer um, experience is, so if we're running an ad, uh, 
on a <clears throat> over the top device to a, to a male targeted audience and you know we repurpose our 30 second as an as an interstitial when they're on I don't know ESPN what have you um, that's just fine so repurposing the uh, the spot in that way you know is um, is is totally is totally fine because that audience is expecting that they're yeah. used to seeing that so it's about the experience it's uh, but but typically we um, we are always making creative that's mobile first okay, because um, you know hands down the performance vis-a-vis -vis the user experience is is, is so much better and and again that's really what's driving the performance at the end of the day yeah for sure so the, the appropriate creative for the appropriate spot andy from a publisher perspective can you weigh in on that too um well shorter is the better yeah <laughs> just we want you to get to our content but we also want to sell the ads um but we did a, a study or there was a study done and i can't remember who did it so don't quote me on it but we saw that 97 percent of digital ads were either 15s or 30s um, and so that tells us that not a lot of ads are getting produced for desktop. Not a lot of ads are getting produced specifically for mobile. Um, and I think that regardless of the length, it's really about the messaging and how you're putting things into that ad. And if you're designing it for the medium, you're going to get more positive reaction to it. And then as a publisher, do you ever kick back an ad? Or how often yeah. does that happen? Oh, yeah. We can't run a lot of our ads in mobile just because they're 30s and you know, certain properties that we have only want to run 15s. Um, so, you know, we try to run everything across every screen, but there are certain things we have to kick back because they're not, uh, they're not 15s. Yeah, for sure. Um, Aaron came in specifically um, to an auto perspective. I think auto was, was fairly early in on mobile video. Um, what's interesting to you um, in terms of different formats uh, creatively? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we have a lot of times we want to start mobile first and often our creative team start with a 60 second ad. And we're like, great, now we have to slice this up and how do we make this the right story in 15 seconds? So we struggle a little bit with the, the storytelling aspect and getting it into the right uh, format and length. But I think what we've done is um, when we do have extra stories to tell, whether they're sort of creative and, and very sort of upper funnel or lower funnel and they're really product and feature focused, um, we're building out a lot of interactivity within our video. So how can we allow, especially in mobile, a consumer to interact more? If they really are interested and they want to see, I want to learn more about the interior. I want to learn more about this additional story within this 30 second spot. Um, then we can allow them to do that. And I think that's something we've seen a lot of success with, especially in tablet devices, um, where people are actually choosing to spend more time with our content when we have other interesting content. And I think that's been a priority for us of anything that's going um, video and mobile is how do we start to tell an additional story or use other assets that we have um, to really round out a 15 second spot. So if there was one thing in mobile video that would mean tomorrow you could shift a much larger percentage of budget from TV, from online, over to mobile, uh, what would that be? Is there a specific thing that you're waiting for to happen in mobile video? ROI. <laughs> so what does that mean, ROI? Like, what does I, that mean to you? More yeah. measurement? Um, Real-time measurement. I mean, you look at, you know, one of my big clients has been around 176 years. Their biggest marketing tool and um, ROI measurement tool is based on traditional media. And it is not um, built for emerging spaces. There are more real-time ways that we need to be measuring mobile, and it's not just video. It's across the board mobile. And I, I laugh, my client stood up and said, it's finally the year of mobile. And I just said, it was a year of mobile 10 years ago. <laughs> um, but we need to find a solution, and that's the hesitancy, is we're pumping hundreds of millions of dollars in mobile, but then it's, we should probably take a step back because we don't have um, the best ROI results. And that's attributed to many things, one of which creative, which is not fantastic for clients. But I mean, that's the one consistent measure that we need to continue to get, yeah. which will increase the confidence level of the spending that our clients are putting in market. And so that's a great point. So by and large, for all of your clients, do you feel like they are fairly confident in mobile video if there's a lot of educating that you're still doing? I mean, what's that, Jeff, do you want to take that part? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's still a lot of educating. Um, you know, I think as an industry, we're still trying to figure it out. Right. So it's not that we have the answers and we can just speak to them from a place of, um, 
you know, you know, we're at that point of you know full measurement across the board. So it's not just, you know, it's not just mobile. I think the challenge is just measurement across the board um, right. in terms of bringing traditional dollars into digital, and then whether that be you know what platform or or, or you know what have you. Um, so I do think that measurement is is is, is a is a big uh, consideration or hurdle to that. And there is ongoing education because I think there's um, just you know the tech, as technology evolves and 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 platforms change and and targeting becomes available. So I, I feel like it's a constant education with clients. Um, and then creative is a whole other you know it's a whole other discussion uh, education process. So um, would you say there is a best audience for mobile video right now? Yale, you know, are you targeting specific buys to mobile video because of the audience you're trying to reach, or is it sort of across the board? It's just generally important. Um, I, I think the the audience is certainly a factor. So um, we've historically bought linear TV on GRPs on reach frequency. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree with Aaron that uh, it's an antiquated way to measure a digital space. There. Is, and the ROI that you don't, there's no ROI that you see because click through rate on video is poor or abysmal. Um, and so you're not really seeing live uh, feeds of how well our, our media dollars are really working. Um, so that's why I was talking before, we're trying to get more into how, does, how do we affect uh, video across all screens for going into stores or purchase intent. So a lot of the media mix modeling um, that we're doing at Zenith Optimedia is trying to help inform our investment across all screens and how do we break that out, but using a person walking into a store from seeing ads, um, those are the things that we're trying to push the boundaries on. Um, I, I think it's still, I mean, you, harnessing, like, lo harnessing location data could be the, the help the, to make that glue between um, consumers and their shopping habits and, and their actual ROI of our media spending. Right. Um, but, but it's certainly, it's, it's evolving so quickly and we need to keep up with that. So third party data, no longer interesting. You know, real time data, very interesting. Is there somewhere in between? Because I realize there's not always an abundance of real time data available. Um, are you working, you know, is there a CRM aspect to some of the mobile video that you're doing now to ingest that type, the consumer and the client data as well? I mean, we layer in purchase-based targeting okay. um, as an informant for almost all of our media buys. So whether it's Datalogic or Catalina, it's something closer, um, gets us closer to the consumer and a better understanding. So we definitely use that frequently. Same for everybody across the board. Yeah, and we're building up our first party data now, so I think that's going to be increasingly important as we're able to actually start rolling that out. And a lot of it is CRM data um, and able being able to really um, segment out our messaging as well to different audiences based on where we know they are um, with the brands, you know, in market versus not. So and so. From a CRM data perspective, uh, does the agency handle that, or does the client handle that, or is there some mix? Like, who sort of manages all of that data and the data relationships with the providers as well? Um, for us, it's all in-house in the agency. Okay, got it. Yeah, Same. It, it's mainly an agency, but it's sort of a collaboration of uh, making sure that the clients are aware of how you're using the data, what the um, data is going out to, how you're identifying their individual customers and reaching them in a privacy compliant manner and, and also trying to make sure that publishers, you can use that same data off of what publishers are, are collecting um, to help inform better decisions. Yeah, so Andy, from a publisher perspective, um, what's your stance on data and, and sharing that type of data and you know, enriching the, the you know, customer we be able to share. We want to be able to collect more. We yep. want to be able to um, segment our users to be able to build packages for advertisers. Um, but it's, it's still kind of TBD. I think a lot of it, will direct sales will definitely be comfortable with that. Whether we're comfortable with sharing first party data and programmatic is still kind of up in the air. 
Yeah, let's talk about programmatic. So um, are you folks buying mobile video programmatically now? Um, is it a decent percentage? Is there a shift happening there as well? Yep, buying it daily. And uh, scale's growing daily as we bring more partners on board to our programmatic solution. But yeah, we're spending a significant amount um, both mobile video and display. And generally via a deal ID or a PMP or all sorts of different combination. Ways. I mean, we have like four different avenues that plug into our overall programmatic solution. So we've worked in direct, the DMP, we've worked everything in. It's okay. far above my head. Have that, so. <laughs> we've got a healthy mix of you know, private marketplace and deal ID. It just depends on the brand and, and, the, um, and, the, and the audiences and so forth. Okay, great. Um, so creatively then, it sounds like there's a little bit of a mix in terms of what we think uh, consumers want to watch and what they actually want to watch. Is there a, a mobile video creative standard that you're going for, you know, at your um, specific agency, or are you? St is everyone still testing different links based on audience? Uh, you know, we're we're constantly testing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we are. Yeah. I mean, there there's 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 standard units that we, we use as part of as part of a rotation. But yeah, and and I think more and more uh, publishers are. Creating new opportunities, new new units, uh, particularly on tablet, where we see obviously so much usage spiking uh, across all audience demos. So um, yeah, so the so the more that becomes available, the the more that's there to test, and and we're at the forefront of that. Okay, great. So one word answer, um, Andy, you can start or. Numeral, numeric answer. Um, if you've got one format running on any of the Turner sites, what's the length of time that it is? Uh, 10. 10, OK. Aaron? Well, the new Snapchat is 10 seconds. I figure that people are going to start building towards that. And hopefully, we can make that a new standard. Got it. I'd love to say short, but I know the creative agencies I work with, so I'm going to go with 15. <laughs> yeah. I would agree. It's an interactive 15. Yeah. Okay. A great interactive 15. <laughs> yep, 15. 15. Okay, 10 and then 15. Um, we have about two minutes left for any questions from the audience, but, but thank you guys so much. I think it was a great discussion. Appreciate it. Good. Oh, here we go. Um, for Jeff, I think it's specific to you. I understand you work on some food brands. In that industry, in that category, back to the uh, repurposing of creative, can you dive a little bit more into the creative experience you've had when it comes to the smaller devices, not necessarily the smart TVs or the OTT? Yeah, sure. So uh, again, I, I, I work across you know, 20, 20 different brands. Um, and typically, what we're seeing are um, Custom creative, especially on tablets, when we know uh, we're, for example, if we're targeting parents with kids in the household between a certain age, and if we look at usage curves between, you know, ages two and four, and, and five to seven, eight to ten, eleven to fifteen, we have a really keen understanding of how much co-viewing is happening, and, and you know how much primary access there is to the device. So we will make specific creative um, with a message for a tablet user where we know there's, there's heavy co-viewing. So that's a great question, because um, we do have to, again, do a lot of you know, bespoke creative for a device when we know that there is a specific, you know, um, a uh, parent, you know, parent uh, age demo in the house. Yeah, like I watched a lot of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. So <laughs> thanks for that. Um, <laughs> any other questions um, for that right here? What is your view on incentivized videos? Was the question. Uh, oh, rewarding. On the publisher side. Um, we have a lot of games with Adult Swim and Cartoon Network, and that seems to be the the ad of choice within games. So it's something that we're moving towards. Um, you know, we have some relationships with agencies that specifically say we can't do that, so we're trying to navigate that. But it's something that, that we feel is for game users who are very finicky 
um, and they'll leave your game in a second if they don't like what's going on. It gives them the power to control when they see an ad, what they get for that ad. Um, so we're all for it. So value exchange then on the publisher yeah. side. I, I would agree. It's a, if it, the value exchange is there, then it works for the consumer. But uh, in general, I would say that most of the media that we purchase doesn't fit with the uh, creative. And so you're just running a spot, and it doesn't match up. And I would say that as an agency, we wouldn't recommend that for our clients. Yeah, sometimes I just feel like they're a little dirty. It's like, <laughs> I'm buying some cheap impressions. Like, I'm going to make you watch this video, and you're going to get something. And then I can tell my client, I have I, one of our clients, I had a um, walk them off a ledge, but they wanted to do rewarded incentivized videos so they could get a million Facebook likes. And I was like, okay, we have a much bigger challenge here. If it's done right, um, gaming platform, if there's, uh, is the best way that I've seen it done, but there has to be a good value exchange because I've seen it done executed poorly more times than I've seen it executed correctly that's actually providing brand value. I mean, I work on a luxury brand, so we really steer clear because I think it's that same sort of feeling of it feels dirty or cheap and it's not premium. So we've really walked far away from that and in social as well. But I, but I think there is value in it. If you can get the right model, you have to get clients involved earlier on to try to make, and with the creative agency, to make it work. And not dirty. Right. <laughs> not dirty at all. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That's all we have time for. Appreciate it, guys. It's great.